The Life of Blessed Henry Suso Part 4 Chapter 27 Of a Grievous Suffering Which Befell Him Through a Companion Once upon a time, when he was about to set forth on a journey, there was assigned to him, for his companion a lay brother who was not quite right in his head. He received this brother very reluctantly, for he had continually before his mind the sufferings which he had on former occasions undergone. Through the ill behavior of his companion, Nevertheless, he submitted himself and took the brother with him. Now, it so happens that they arrived before breakfast at a village in which an annual fair was being held on that day, and a very great number of people of all sorts were collected together. The servitor's companion, having been wet with rain, went into a house to a fire, the servitor's companion, having been wet with the rain, went into a house to a fire, and declared that he would not go about with him anywhere, adding that the brother must do whatever he had to do without him, and that he would wait for him there. The brother had scarcely left the house when his companion rose up and seated himself at table with a rough set of fellows and dealers who had traveled to the fair. When these men perceived that the wine had got well into his head, and he had left the table, and was standing under the yard door, gaping about him, they set upon him, saying that he had stolen a cheese from them. Now at that very moment when these wicked people were treating him in this cruel manner, there came up four or five good-for-nothing soldiers, who also fell upon him exclaiming that the scoundrel monk was a prisoner, for it was just then that there was the outcry about poisoning. Upon this they laid hold of him, and made a great uproar, so that there was a general rush to the place. When the lay brother saw what course things had taken, and that he was a prisoner, he wished very much to get free, and turned round and said to them, Stop a moment. Only stand still and let me speak, and I will confess to you, all of you, and tell you how things are. They stood still, and everybody listened, upon which he began thus, Look at me now. You cannot help seeing that I am a fool and a witless man, and no one makes any account of me. But my companion is a man of consummate wisdom, and the order has entrusted him with little bags of poison to throw into the wells between this place and Alsace, whether he is now journeying, and his intention is to defile every place to which he comes with vile poison. But you see that you make haste and see him, or he will have done a murderous deed which can never be healed. For he has just now taken out a little bag of poison and cast it into the village well, that all those who have come here to the fair shall drink of the well, may die without fail. This is why I say stayed behind, and would not go out with him, for it is a great grief to me. And as a voucher that I speak the truth, you must know that he has a great bag for books, full of little bags of poison and, qu and a quantity of florins, which he and the order have received from the Jews for carrying out this mortal design. When the wild crew and all those who had been forced their way into the house heard these words, they became mad with rage, and with loud yells they shouted, Quick, after the murderer, that he escape us not! and one seized a pike, and another a battle-axe, each one taking what he could, and they rushed about in a state of frenzy, opening, forcing open the houses and the closets, where they fancied they might find him, and stabbing with their naked swords through the beds and the straw, until the whole affair ran together 
on account of the uproar. Among the crowd were the strangers from other districts, honorable men, who knew the servitor well, when they heard his name. The persons came forward and told the others that they were wronging him, for that he was a very pious man, and he would be very sorry to commit such a crime. At length, as they could not find him, they gave over the search, and carried his command companion as a prisoner to the village magistrate who ordered him to be shut up in a cell. The servitor knew nothing of all this trouble, but when he thought the time for breakfast had come, and that his companion had quite dried himself at the fire, he set out for the inn, intending to breakfast there. When he reached the inn, they began to tell him the sad news, and related to him all that had happened upon which he ran straight away in terror to the house where the magistrate and his companion were, and besought the magistrate to release him. The magistrate replied that this could not be, for that he intended to confine him in a tower as a punishment for his offense. This seemed hard and unbearable to the servitor, and he ran hither and thither, seeking help, but he could find no one to aid him in his manner. After he had busied himself in this way for a long time, he at length, with much shame and bitterness, obtained his companion's release, though at great cost to himself. He now fancied that his sufferings were at an end, but that they were just beginning. For he had no sooner got free from the authorities with loss and trouble than his life was exposed to eminent danger. When, the, when he left the magistrate about vesper time, a cry was raised among the common people and the mob that the poisoner was there, and they yelled at him as at a murderer, so that he dared not pass along in front of the village. They pointed him, saying, That is the poisoner. He shall not escape us. He must be killed. He will not let him off for money like the magistrate. When he tried to escape by slipping away into the village, they yelled still more fiercely after him. Some of them said, We ought to drown him in the Rhine, which ran past the village. The other said, No, the filthy murderer will defile all the water. We should burn him. A huge peasant, in a sooty jerkin, snatched up a pike, and forcing his way through the crowd, cried out, Hear me, my masters, all of you. There is no more shameful death to which the can put this heretic than if I run him through with this long pike, just as we spit a poisonous toad. Even so, in the like manner, let me spit this poisoner naked on this pike, and then lift him up backwards and drive him so firmly into the stout fence that he will not be able to fall off. There let his foul carcass be dried by the winds, and all who may have a view of the murderer and curse him after his vile death, so that his misery may be greater in this world and the next, for richly has this utter miscreant deserved his fate. The servitor heard these words with such terror that he groaned deeply, and the great tears rolled down his face from anguish. All those who stood around the ring and saw him wept bitterly. Some beat their breasts through pity, and stuck their hands together above their heads. But no one dared to say anything in presence of the infuriated people, for they were afraid of being attacked themselves. When night began to fall, he went up and down with weeping eyes, un entreating that someone, for God's sake, would pity him and give him shelter. But they repulsed him cruelly. Some kind-hearted women would have gladly taken him in, but they dared not. At length, when the wretched sufferer was thus in the straits of death, and all help from man had failed him, and they were only waiting for the moment to fall upon him and kill him, he sunk down beside a fe fence through ang anguish and fear of death, and, 
lifting up his miserable and swollen eyes to heaven, exclaimed, O Father of all pity, when thou st when wilt thou bring me today in my great deed? O kind heart, how hast thou forgotten thy great kindness towards me? O Father, O true, kind Father, help me, poor wretch, in these straits. I cannot resolve them in my heart which is already dead, whether it be more tolerable for me to be drowned, or be burned, or to die upon a pike. For one of these deaths must now be mine. I commend my wretched spirit to thee today, and I pray thee to show me pity in my miserable death, for they are nigh unto me who are resolved to kill me. This sorrowful plaint was overheard by a priest, who, running thither, snatched him by force out of their hands and brought him home into his house. And, after keeping him during the night, that nothing might happen to him, set him on his way next morning early, safe out of all his troubles. Chapter 28 Of a Murderer Once upon a time, when the servitor was returning from the Netherlands, his road lay up the Rhine. He had with him a companion who was young and a good walker. Now it happened one day that he could not keep up with his swift companion, for he had become very tired and ill, and in consequence the companion had gone ahead of him about half a mile. The servitor looked back to see if anyone was following in whose company he might go through the forest and the skirts of which he had arrived for it was late in the day. The forest, moreover, was extensive, and of ill repute, for many persons had been murdered in it. The servitor therefore stopped at the outskirts of the forest and waited to see whether any one was coming. At length two persons approached at a very rapid pace. The one was a young and pretty woman, the other a tall, ferocious-looking man, carrying a spear and a long knife, and he had on a black jerkin. The servitor was struck with dread at the terrible appearance of the man, and he looked round to see if there was anyone following, but he saw no one. He thought within himself, O oh Lord, what kind of people are these? How am I going to go through this great forest, and how will it fare with me? He then made a sign of the cross over his heart and ventured it. And when they were already deep in the forest, the woman came forward to him and asked him who he was and what was his name. As soon as he had told her his name, she answered, Dear sir, I know you well by name. I pray you hear my confession. Then she began to confess, saying, Alas, worthy sir, it is with sorrow that I tell you my sad lot. Do you see the man who follows us? He is by trade a murderer, and he murders people here in this wood and elsewhere, and takes from them their money and clothes. He never spares anyone. He has deceived me and carried me off from my friends, who are persons of good repute, and I am forced to be his wife. The servitor was so terrified by these words that he nearly fainted and he cast a very sorrowful look all around him, if happily there were any one in sight or hearing, or any mode of escape. But there was no one to be seen or heard in the dark forest coming after them, except the murderer. Then he thought within himself, If, weary as thou art, thou triest to flee, he will soon overtake and kill thee. But if thou criest out, no one will hear thee in this wilderness, and death will again be thy lot. He looked upward very woefully, and said, O oh my God, what is to become of me on this day? O oh death, how nigh art thou to me? When the woman had finished confessing, she went back to the murderer, and besought him privately, saying, Come now, dear friend, go forward and make thy confession also. 
for it is a pious belief among my people that whoever confesses to him, however sinful he may be, he will never be abandoned by God. Do it then, that thou may help thee for his sake at thy last hour. While the two were thus whispering to each other, the servitor's terror knew no bounds, and the thought came to him, Thou art betrayed. The murderer was silent and went forward. Now when the poor servitor saw the murderer advancing upon him, spear in hand, his whole frame quivered with dread, and he thought within himself, Alas, now thou art lost, for he knew that although for he knew not what they had been talking about. At this point, it happened that the Rhine ran close to the wood, and the narrow path lay along the bank. Moreover, the murderer so contrived it that the brother was forced to walk on the side of the water while he was next to the wood. As the servitor went along in this manner with trembling heart, the murderer began to confess, and revealed to him all the murders and crimes which he had ever committed. Especially he spoke of a horrible murder which struck terror into the servitor's heart, which he thus described. I came once into this wood to rob and murder, as I have done today, and meeting with a venerable priest I confessed to him, while he was walking beside me at this very spot, just as you are now doing, and when the confession was over I drew forth this knife and ran him through with it, and then thrust him from me over the bank into the Rhine. These words and gestures with, with which the murderer accompanied them made the servitor turn pale and terrified him so exceedingly that the cold sweat of death ran down his face upon his breast, and he shook with fear and became speechless, and all his senses failed him, and he kept looking at every moment at his side, expecting that the same knife would be thrust into him, that he would then be pushed over into the river. Now, just as he was on the point of falling down through the agony of mind and utter inability to advance a step, he cast an exceedingly piteous look all around him, like a person longing to escape death. The murderer's damsel caught sight of his woe-stricken face and running up received him in her arms as he was falling and holding him fast said, Good sir, do not be afraid. He will not kill you. The murderer added, Must, Much good has been told me concerning you, and you shall have the benefit of it today, for I will let you live. Beg of God to help and favor me, a poor criminal, at my last hour, for your sake. In the meantime they had come out of the forest, and the servitor's companion was sitting there under a tree waiting for him. The murderer and his partner passed on. But the servitor, crawling to his companion, sank down on the ground while his heart and his whole body trembled, as in an attack of agu, and he laid thus motionless for a long time. At length, on recovering himself, he woes, rose up and went on his way. He besought God earnestly and with deep inward sighing of the murderer, that he would let him have the benefit of the pious confidence which he had conceived towards the servitor, and not suffer him to be damned in his last hour. God gave the servitor such an inward assur assurance of this, that it was impossible for him to doubt that the murderer would, would be saved. Chapter 29 Of Perils by Water on one occasion, when he had traveled to Strasbourg, according to his custom, and was on his return home, he fell into a great stream of water caused by an overflow of the Rhine. He had with him the new little book which he had just finished, and with which the foul fiend was very wroth. As he was being swept helplessly along by the current at the peril of his life, the faithful God so ordered it, and that at every moment there came, came up by chance from Strasbourg a young, newly made Prussian knight, who ventured, who, 
Venturing into the turbid and raging water saved the servitor and his companion from a miserable death. Once upon a time he set forth on a journey under obedience, when the weather was cold, and after traveling on a carriage the whole day through, until evening without food in the cold wind and frosty weather, he arrived at a troubled piece of water, which was deep and rapid, owing to the great quantity of rain which had fallen. The man who drove him went too near the bank through carelessness, and, the carriage turning over, the brother was shot out of it and fell into the water on his back. The carriage fell over on him, so that he could not turn himself in the water, either to the side or to that, nor yet help himself at all. And in this state he and the carriage floated down for some distance towards a mill. The driver and the others ran thither, and jumping into the water seized hold of him, and tried their best to draw him out. But the heavy carriage lay upon him and pressed him down. When at last they succeeded with great labor in lifting the carriage off him, they drew him out to the land dripping wet, and he had not been long out of the water before his clothes froze upon him from the excessive cold. He began to tremble with cold so that his teeth chattered, and in the miserable plight he stood still for a long time, and then looking up to God exclaimed, O oh my God, what am I to do? What course am I to adopt? It is late, and night is at hand, and if there is no town or village near, where I can warm and refresh myself, I must die. And what a wretched kind of death this will be! He looked around on all sides, until at last he espied, far away upon a hill, a very small hamlet. He crawled thither, all wet and frozen as he was, and by the time he reached it night had set in. He went up and down begging for shelter in God's name but he was driven away from the houses, and no one would take pity on him. Then the frost and fatigue began to attack his heart, and put him in fear for his life, upon which he cried in a loud voice to God, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, it would have been better hadst thou let me be drowned, for then there would have been an end of it, instead of my being frozen to death in this street. These words of lamentation were overheard by a peasant, who had before this driven him away, but now touched with compassion, took him in his arms and brought him into his house where he spent a miserable night. Chapter 30 Of a short interval of rest which God once granted him. God had accustomed him to this, that as soon as one suffering left him, another was ready at hand to take its place. And in this way God played with him in unintermittingly. Once only he allowed him an interval of rest, but it did not last long. During this season of interaction he came to a nunnery, and, being asked by his spiritual children how things went with him, he replied, I fear they are going very ill with me at present, and for this reason. It is now four weeks since anyone has attacked me in my person or my good name, quite unlike what used to happen to me, so that I fear lest God has forgotten me. Now he had not sat long with them at the grate, when there came a brother of the order who called him out and said, I was a little while ago at a castle, and the lord of it asked after you, where you were, and he did this very savagely. And then he lifted up his hands and swore before everyone that wherever he found you he would run a sword through you. The same thing was also done by several fierce soldiers, his kinsmen, and they have been searching for you in different monasteries around about in order to execute their evil designs upon you. Be warned, therefore, and take care of yourself, as you love your life. The servitor was struck with terror at these words, and said to the brother, 
I should be very glad to hear what I have done to deserve the penalty of death. He answered, The lord of the castle has been told that you have misled his daughter, as well as many other persons, into a particular kind of life, to which the name of spirit is given, and that those who follow it are called spirits. And he has been assured that they are the most abandoned set on the face of the earth. But more than this, there was another ferocious man there, who said of you, He has robbed me of a dear wife. She draws her veil down now, and will no longer look at me. She will only look inwards. He is the cause of this, and he shall pay for it. When the servitor heard this tale, he replied, Praised be God, and hastening back immediately to the great, said to his daughters, Be of good cheer, my children. God has been mindful of me, and has not forgotten me. Then he told them the cruel tale, how that men were seeking to return him evil for the good he had done. Chapter 31 how he once entered into a loving account with God. During the season of the servitor's sufferings, and in places where he then lived, if he sometimes happened to go into the infirmary to give a little refreshment to his sick body, or if he sat silent at a table according to his custom, he was sorely tried by mocking discord and unseemly words, and this at first was a great suffering to him, and made him feel such pity for himself that the hot tears would often run down his cheeks and force their way with what he ate or drank into his mouth. At such times he used to look up silently to God, and, groaning inwardly, exclaim, Alas, O God, art not thou content with the misery which I suffer day and night? Must even my scanty food at table be mingled with great persecutions? This happened to him oftentimes and abundantly. Once on leaving table he could restrain himself no longer, and, going into his place of privacy, he said to God, Dear God, Lord of the whole world, be gentle and gracious to me. Poor man! for I must enter into account with thee to-day. I cannot help doing it, and though in truth thou owest no man aught, and art bound to no one by reason of thy high sovereignty, nevertheless it beseems thy infinite goodness graciously to suffer a fall heart to seek refreshment in thee when it has no one else to whom it can make its plaint or who can comfort it. O Lord, I call thee to witness, who knowest all things, that from my mother's womb all my life, through I have a tender heart. I never yet saw anyone in pain or sadness, but had a heartfelt pity for him, and I never willingly gave ear to talk that would grieve anyone whether behind his back or in his presence. All my companions must allow that it has been seldom heard of me that I ever by my words made worse the case of any brother, or of any one else, either to the prelate or to others. But I made every one's case better, so far as I was able, and when I could not do this I was silent or I fled away that I might not hear it. Out of pity, I showed all the more friendship towards those who were wounded in their honor, that they may easily recover their good repute. I was called the faithful father of the poor. I was a special friend of all God's friends. All who ever came to me in sorrow or aggrieved always received some good counsel from me, which made them leave me joyful and consoled, for I wept with those who wept, and I sorrowed with those who were in sorrow, until, like a mother, I brought them around again. No one ever caused me any suffering, however great, 
but if he only smiled kindly on me afterwards. It was all passed over in God's name, as if it had never been. O oh Lord, I will say no more about mankind, for I could not even see or hear the needs or sorrows of all the little birds and beasts and other creatures of God without being pierced to the heart thereby, and I used to pray the kind Lord of all to help them. Whatever lives on earth met with favor and tender treatment from me. And yet thou, O kind Lord, sufferest, of who dear Paul speaks, calling them false brethren, to behave to me so exceedingly cruel, as thou knowest well, O Lord, that it is manifest enough. Alas, kind Lord, look at this and console me, for it with thyself. After he spent a long time in thus refreshing his heart with God, there came upon him a stillness of repose, and he was inwardly illuminated by God in this wise. The childish account which thou hast entered in unto me comes from this, that thou dost not always keep before thee the words and ways of the suffering Christ. Thou must know that God is not satisfied with the mere kindness of heart which thou professest. He wants still more from thee. What he wants is that when thou art openly ill-treated by any one in words or behavior, thou shalt not only bear it patiently, but thou shalt die to self so utterly as not to go to sleep that night until thou hast sought out thy persecutor, and as far as possible calmed his incensed heart with thy sweet words and ways. For with such meek lowliness... Thou wilt take from him a sword and knife, and make him powerless in his malevolence. See, this is the old and perfect way in which dear Christ taught his disciples, when he said, Behold, I send you as lambs among the wolves. Luke chapter 10 verse 3 When the servitor came to himself again, this perfect way seemed to him too burdensome, and was grievous to him to contemplate it, and still more grievous to follow it. Nevertheless, he submitted himself thereto, and began to learn it. Now it happened one day after this that a lay brother spoke very insolently to him, and abused him openly. The servitor bore it patiently in silence and he would gladly had let it rest there, but he was inwardly admonished that he must do something better than this. Accordingly, when it became evening, and the brother was eating in the infirmary, the servitor went and stood in front of the infirmary, waiting for him to come out. As soon as he came out, the servitor fell on his knees before him, and addressed him in words of humble entreaty. I pray thee, dear worthy father, Honor God in me, poor man, and if I have troubled you, forgive me for God's sakes. The brother stood still and, looking up in amazement, exclaimed with a loud cry, Ah, me, what a marvelous thing you are doing, and yet you never injured me, nor anyone else. It is I who had openly outraged you by my villainous words. You must indeed forgive me. I entreat you. And in this way his heart was stilled and restored to peace. Once upon a time, as he sat at table in the guest house, a brother insulted him with scornful talk, upon which the servitor turned towards him very lovingly and smiled upon him, as though he had just received a precious jewel from him. The brother was so moved by this that he became silent and turned his face again in kindliness towards the servitor. When the meal was ended, the brother spoke of it in the town, saying, I have never been so grossly insulted as I was today at table. 
for, after I had treated the servitor with open rudeness at table, he bowed his face towards me very sweetly, that I became red with shame, and it always shall be a good lesson to me. Chapter 32 How His Suffering Once Brought Him Nigh to Death It happened to him once during many nights, and that moment he awoke from sleep, something began to repeat in him the psalm of our Lord's suffering. Deus, Deus meus, respice in me. Psalm 21 This psalm was spoken by Christ on the gallows of the cross. When he had forsaken in his distress by his heavenly Father and by everyone, the servitor was struck with consternation at the continual interior whispering when he woke, and weeping bitterly, he cried to Christ among the cross with these words, Alas, my Lord and my God, if it be met and necessary that I should once more suffer a new crucifixion with thee, accomplish, I beseech thee, thy pure and innocent death in me, poor man, and be with me, and help me to come forth victorious over all my sufferings. When this cross arrived, as had been foreshown him, sufferings of no ordinary kind, and of those whose nature nothing is here said, began to increase continually upon him, and to multiply from day to day, until at last they became so great, and weighed down the sick man so heavily that they brought him to the very extremity of death. One evening, when he was away from the monastery, and had gone to his bed to rest, there fell on him such an utter protest, prostration of strength, that he thought he must now inevitably die of faintness, and he lay there quite motionless so that there was no pulse in any of his veins. When this was observed by a faithful and good-hearted man who tended him, and whom he had won to God at great cost to himself, the man ran to him in bitter grief, and pressed his hand against his heart, to try whether there was still life there. But his heart was without movement, and beat no more than that of a dead man would. At, the, at this he sank to the ground in great sorrow, and while the tears streamed down his face, he cried aloud with piteous lamentations, O oh God, alas for this noble heart, which many a day has borne thee! O oh, merciful God, so lovingly within it, and was told of thee so pleasantly by word and by writing, in every land. So to many erring men for their consolation, how it was perished today! Oh, what evil tidings is it that this noble heart must rot, and cannot live a long time yet for thy glory and the consolation of many! Thus piteously lamenting with streaming eyes, he bent over the servitor and touched his heart and mouth and arms, to see whether he still lived or was dead. But there was no motion there. His face was deadly white, his mouth black, and all sign of life had vanished, as from a dead man laid out upon his beer. This lasted as long as it would take to walk a mile. Meanwhile, the object of his soul's contemplation, while he lay thus in seeming death, was not else but God and the Godhead, the true and the truth, indwelling, everlasting oneness. It happened indeed that before he became so very weak and was carried out of himself in ecstasy, he began to speak in his heart fond words to God in this wise, Ah, everlasting truth, thy deep abysses are hidden from every creature. I, thy poor servitor, see clearly that there is now an end of me, as my departed strength betokens. 
I speak now at my life's verge to thee, mighty Lord, whom no one can deceive, because all things are manifest to thee. Thou alone knowest how things stand between me and thee. Therefore I seek grace of thee, faithful heavenly Father, and wheresoever, alas, I have broken out into unlikeness and deflection from the supreme truth, I grieve for it, and I repent me of it with all my heart, and I beseech thee to blot it out with thy precious blood, according to thy graciousness and my necessity. Remember that all the days of my life I have celebrated and exalted as high as I could thy pure and innocent blood, and it must now at my departure wash me clean from all my sins. Oh, kneel down, I entreat you, all ye saints, especially thou, my kind and gracious Lord, Saint Nicholas, and I lift up your hands to help me to beseech the Lord for a good end. O oh, pure, gentle, kind Mother Mary, reach me thy hand today, and at this my last hour graciously receive my soul beneath thy shelter, for thou art my heart's joy and consolation. O oh, Lady and Mother mine, into thy hands I commend my spirit. O oh, dear angels, be mindful that, all my life through, my heart has ever laughed within me, when I only heard you named, and forgot not how often you have brought me in my sorrows heavenly joys, and guarded me from my foes. O oh, gentle spirits, is it now only that my greatest straits are come, and that I most need your help? Aid me, then and shield me from the horrible sights of my foes, the evil spirits. O Lord of heaven, I praise thee for having bestowed on me at my death hour such entire consciousness, and I go thence the full Christian faith without a doubt and without fear. And I forgive all those who have ever made me suffer, as thou upon the cross forgavest those who slew thee. Lord, Lord, thy divine sacramental body, which receiveth to-day at Mass, ill though I was, must be my guardian and my convoy to thy divine countenance. My last prayer, which I make now at my end, gentle Lord of Heaven, is for my dear spiritual children, who, whether by special bonds of faithfulness or by confession, have lovingly attached themselves to me in this miserable world. O oh, merciful God! As thou, at thy departure, didst commend thy dear disciples to thy heavenly Father, even so in the selfsame love let those be commended to thee, and grant them also a good and holy end. And now I turn myself away altogether from the whole creatures, and I turn me wholly to the pure Godhead, the primal fountainhead of everlasting bliss. After he had held much discourse within his heart in this fond, loving fashion, he was transported out of himself in ecstasy, and fell into the faint described above. At length, when he and the others fancied that he must have departed, he came to himself again, and his affrighted heart began to revive, and his sick limbs to recover strength, and he got well, and returned to life again as before. Chapter 33 How a man should offer up his sufferings to the praise and glory of God. When the suffering servitor had deeply meditated upon this long and weary warfare, and moreover had come to see it God's hid den, hidden marvels, he turned one day to God, sighing inwardly, and said, Alas, Lord, 
These sufferings are in their outward aspect like sharp thorns which pierce through flesh and bone. Therefore, gentle Lord, cause some sweet fruit of good instruction to issue forth from these sharp thorns of sufferings, that we, poor men, may suffer more patiently, and be better able to offer up our sufferings to thy praise and glory. After he had continued for a long time earnestly beseeching God for this, it came to pass one day that he was wrapped in est ecstasy, and his bodily senses being abstracted, it was sweetly said to him within his soul, I will show thee today the high nobility of my life, and how a sufferer would offer up his sufferings to the praise and glory of the loving God. At these sweet interior words his soul was melted within him, and his bodily senses being stilled in ecstasy, the arms, as it were, of his soul stretched themselves forth out of the unfathomable fullness of his heart to the far ends of the universe, even to heaven and earth. And he thanked God with a boundless heartfelt yearning, saying, Hitherto, O God, I have praised thee in my musings, and with the aid of all that is pleasant and delightful in all creatures. But now I must joyously break forth into a new song and a strange kind of praise, which I knew not before, since I have only now come to know it by suffering. And it is this, I pray for my heart's bottom deaths that all the sorrow and pain which I ever suffered, as well as the woes and agonies of every human heart, the smarts of all wounds, the anguish of all the sick, the groans of all sad souls, the tears of all weeping eyes, the misery of all the oppressed, the distress of all needy widows and orphans, the pining want of all the poor and hungry, the outpoured blood of all martyrs, the crushing of self-will in all who are young and blooming, the afflictive exercise of all God's friends, and all the secret and open pains and sorrows which I or any other poor sufferer have endured in body, goods, or honor, in weal or woe, or which any one will ever have to suffer now to doomsday. These, I pray, be an everlasting source of praise to thee, O Heavenly Father, and an eternal honor to thy only begotten suffering Son from everlasting to everlasting. And I, thy poor servitor, desire today to be faithful representative of all sufferers who perchance have been unable to return to full account their sufferings, by patient thanksgiving and praise of God for them, and I wish in their place to offer up the suffering and praise of God, however they may have borne them, and now offer them up to thee in their stead, just as if myself alone had suffered them in all my body and in my heart, as it is my heart's wish to do, and I tender them all this day to thy only begotten suffering Son, so that they may be an everlasting praise to him, and that sufferers may be comforted, whether they are still here in this veil of sorrow, or in the next world in thy hand. O all ye who suffer with me, look at me and give ear to what I say to you. We, poor members, ought to console ourselves and rejoice in our venerable head. God's lovely only begotten Son, so that he has suffered for us, and never passed one pleasant day on earth. Behold, if there is one rich man in a poor family, the whole family rejoices in him. Ah, venerable head of us all, thy members, be gracious to us, and where through human frailty true patience fails us in any affliction, do thou make up for thee before thy heavenly Father. 
Bethink thee how thou earnest once to the help of thy servants. And when this courage was all but failing him through suffering, did thou sayest to him, Be of good cheer, and look at me. I was noble and poor. I was tender and in misery. I was born from out of the fullness of all joys, and yet I was full of sorrow. Therefore, as valiant knights of our imperial lord, let us not lose heart. As noble father, followers of our venerable leader, let us be of good cheer and rejoice to suffer. For if there were no other profit in good and suffering, that we became more like a fair bright mirror Christ, the more closer that we copied him in this, our sufferings would be well laid out. It seemed to me in truth that even if God meant to give the same reward hereafter to those who suffer and to those who do not suffer, we ought still to choose suffering of our lot were it only to be like him. For love produces likeness and devotion to the beloved, so far as it can and may. But, oh, how dare we presume to take upon ourselves what we ought to resemble thee, O noble Lord, in our sufferings. In our sufferings, and how unlike they are. O Lord, thou art the sufferer who has never deserved to suffer. But where is he, alas, who can pride himself that he has never given cause for sufferings? For if one hand he is guiltless in that for which he suffers, on the other he deserves punishment on other counts. Therefore we place ourselves, I mean all we who have suffered, in great right wide ring round and round and we place thee our dear gentle lover in the midst of us even in the ring of us suffering mortals we spread out far and wide our thirsty veins with great longing towards thee the rich outbursting fountain of all grace behold and marvel just as the earth which is most cracked with drought takes the best in stormy st streams of watery rain. Even so we heavily laden men, the more guilty we are towards thee, the more closely do we cr clasp thee to us with outspread hearts, and our long desire is that, come what may, according to the promise of thy divine mouth, we may be washed in thy streaming and trickling wounds, and be set thereby from every sin. For all the which thou shalt receive everlasting praise and honor from us, and we shall obtain grace from thee, since all unlikeness will be removed from us by thy almightiness. After the servitor had remained sitting without movement for a long time, during which all was revealed to him with great solemnity in the innermost interior of his soul, he rose up joyfully and thanked God for the grace he had received.